Yeah, I was thinking that too in terms of like his research and his time working at the hospital. And it, uh, yeah, he was, must have been a very busy guy. I don't know how much he slept. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm listening to that. I'm thinking, how did he do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, to be with me today and to talk about one of your favorite saints. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bernie. And uh, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. Can you introduce us to who you're going to speak about today? Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to speak about St. Giuseppe Moscati. So he's an Italian physician who was born in the late 1800s and mm -hmm. practiced in the early 1900s. Okay. And so he was born in Benevento, Italy, uh, so just outside of Naples. Mm -hmm. And he was the seventh of nine children. And so he came from a Catholic family. Um, you know, they attended Mass regularly. Mm -hmm. They recited the rosary every day at home. You know, his father was a judge. And, um, you know, at the time there would have been some pressure for him to join the Freemasons. Okay. And he resisted. You know, he held on to his Catholic faith. And so when Giuseppe was uh, four, they ended up moving to Naples because his dad got a job as the uh, presiding judge of the Court of Appeals there. Okay. And uh, so he received his first Holy Communion in Naples in 1888. And actually he was confirmed in um, 1898, so when he was 18 years old. You now oh. with a lot of the saints, um, I find that a lot of their stories, you know, they're struck by tragedy or suffering early on in their life. Mm -hmm. And that was the case with Giuseppe as well. So his brother Alberto, who he was quite fond of, ended up um, suffering a head injury when mm -hmm. he was in a military parade. And so this resulted in, I believe, a hemorrhage and seizures after. So it was quite, uh, quite difficult for Giuseppe and his family to um, deal with his brother's illness. And I know he spent a lot of hours by his brother's bedside. And just a couple months after he started medical school, his father became ill after attending mass. And so he had a hemorrhage in his brain oh, and goodness. ended up dying two days later. Mm. And so this was especially tough on the family economically. And I mean, at the same time, his brother Alberto was, was suffering with his illness during this time as well. Sure. So it was um, quite challenging for, for him and his family. Now, uh, even from a young age, he seems to have empathy for the sick. So he says, as a boy, I looked with interest at the hospital just outside of where they lived which my father pointed out to me in the distance from the terrace of our house, inspiring me feeling of pity for the nameless suffering that was alleviated within those walls. So the question comes up, you know, why did he decide to study medicine when he came from a family of lawyers? And, you know, there might have been motivation in terms of uh, a position within society or wealth or whatever the case may be. Uh, but for him, his only desire was to alleviate the physical pain the spiritual bewilderment of brethren who are struck by the atrocity of diseases. Mm. I thought that was pretty profound. A real strong calling right from the beginning. Oh, for sure. Mm. Yeah. Now, he possessed quite a few uh, remarkable traits and, and virtues. So he was uh, very intelligent. So even from a young age, he was noted to be an excellent studi uh, student, and he studied quite hard. He earned his degree in 1903, on the exact same day that uh, Pope Pius X was elected to the pontificate. Oh, interesting. And in 1911... He was involved in helping to fight a cholera epidemic in Naples. He did quite a bit of research and had numerous scientific publications. And he had quite a, an extensive medical knowledge, so it seems like a lot of people that were studying to become specialists would come to him asking advice or clarification, even though he was just a generalist. Okay. And with some of the diagnoses he made, a lot of his colleagues might have scoffed at or were critical of, but oftentimes his diagnoses were confirmed uh, later on. So it, it just spoke to the fact that he had this uh, natural talent and gift from God mm -hmm. um, to be able to make these diagnoses. Now he also possessed a number of virtues as well. He was a very humble guy. So there's a quite a you know almost dramatic story of on April 8th 1906 uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted. And so that's a volcano just outside of Naples. There's a little town called Torre del Greco, mm -hmm. which is about only about six kilometers from the um, uh, volcano itself. Mm -hmm. And so in the result of this, there was all this ash coming into the air. He decided to make the trip to the town there because there was a residence that housed um, elderly people, people with mental illness, that sort of thing. 
And when he got there, he made the judgment call to have the residents cleared out. Um, so literally, I guess minutes after they cleared out the last person, the roof collapsed because of the weight of the ash. And uh, later he wrote a letter of commendation for all the staff who helped him. And he humbly downplayed his, his part in the uh, rescue. So, I mean, not only does it show his, his humility, but his courage as well. I mean, literally sure. to be um, taking people out just minutes before this roof collapse, yeah. he was uh, showing a lot of uh, fortitude there. Now, um, there, in 1917, there came a, a vacancy for position in the chair of physiological chemistry. And a lot of the faculty wanted Giuseppe to take the position because of his intelligence and his research. Right. Um, he declined. And he actually recommended a colleague take the position instead. Later on, he also passed up a tenured professorship. It was thought that he declined the professorship in order to mortify his own ambition. Uh, he wanted to dedicate himself more fully to um, spending time with patients, to educating young doctors. Now, as an interesting aside, so the hospital that he worked at in Naples is called the uh, I'm not great with my Italian, but Ospedale degli Incurabili. Now, since it was built in the 1500s, there's noted or estimated to be about 25 saints, blesseds, or venables associated with that particular hospital. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Interesting. And wow. so it's, it's pretty cool to, uh, to see that there's just that many holy people involved mm -hmm. in, in work there. Hmm. Now, he was also a very um, charitable and prudent um, person. You know, he's noted to say that the sick are the face of Christ. He had just such a firm belief that um, by serving his brethren, he was serving God. Mm -hmm. I know when his, um, in the book that I'd read about him, he said, when, the studies, when his studies became more complex and difficult, he felt more urgently the need to reconcile science and charity. And the sick person, he would see a body and a soul, both in need of help. He says, suffering should not be treated as a twitch or a muscular contraction. But as the cry of a soul to whom another brother, the doctor, runs with art and love of charity. So he just had this deep sense of, you know, his role was to relieve the suffering of his, of his uh, fellow uh, brothers and sisters. And he rec recognized the limits of medicine at that time. I mean, they certainly didn't enjoy the same right. level of technology yeah. and availability of uh, things that we have today. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing the limits of medicine, he says, and then what can we doctors do? Very little. Therefore, being unable to help the body, uh, let us help the soul, hmm. which I thought was really cool. That's a beautiful, like just a beautiful marriage of, of treating body and soul, which doctors don't always do. That's true. So, I mean, good for him. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, really impressive the way he um, brought that together. Mm -hmm. now, I like, uh, sorry not to interrupt, but I just, you know, when you said that he saw the face of Christ in his patients, that, that's, you know, I mean, that's St. Mother Teresa. Yeah. It's exactly her, her approach, too. Yeah. So what a beautiful thing. Oh, for sure. Yeah, to be able to recognize that and put that into practice, it's mm -hmm. really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And just a wonderful example, too, for us as, as lay people. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, that's um, something that we can strive towards is, is holiness, even in a lay person's life. So, right. Yeah. Now he was he was also very generous too. So sometimes he would give his entire contents of what he had earned um, just to the donation box in church. There would be um, patients who and he was known as the doctor of the poor. Uh, so he you know if he was seeing a patient that couldn't afford his services, he wouldn't charge them. Right. Sometimes he would even leave them money for um, prescriptions or for food or whatever the case may be. For a lot of his colleagues at the time, they would have had motor vehicles or automobiles or horse and mm -hmm. carriage. For him, he walked and he took to public transport. So he wasn't attached to the same uh, material things that his colleagues were. Now, when he received gifts of food on Christmas, Easter, his birthday, all of that was redirected to the poor. So he had just the strong sense of, of charity towards others and helping out those in mm -hmm. need. And he was also a very faithful man. So when he was providing some advice to a new colleague, he said, in all your works, look to heaven and to the eternity of life in the soul. And then you will have a very different orientation from the one that merely human considerations would suggest to you. And your work will be inspired for the better. Wow. And I thought, yeah, what a beautiful quote. And, you know, in the midst of busyness of everyday life, it's good to be able to take that step back and say, okay, you know, this is all for, for eternity. 
not just in the moment or not just for worldly things, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So he went to church and received Holy Communion every day, always preparing well and making a thanksgiving afterwards. And if he was seeing patients outside of Naples, which oftentimes he would do, he would travel back to Naples by night, at night, fasting in order to be able to receive communion the next day. Wow. So he, uh, there's also a story where he went to visit a friend outside of Naples for a couple days. And the friend, knowing his habit, arranged for the local priest to come in and say Mass at his private chapel. Well, he forgot to tell the priest to come back the second day. So Giuseppe remedied the situation by waking up early and just, just going to church. So it was not something that he gave up when he was, you know, taking a break no, on vacation. Just dedicated to worship. Absolutely. Dedicated to the Eucharist. Absolutely. Yeah. He also had a very special devotion to uh, the Most Holy Mother of God. Uh, I believe in particular to Our Lady of Good Counsel. Mm -hmm. So he recited the Holy Rosary every day and other devotions to her. And during hospital rounds, if he heard the Angelus bells going, he would stop and pray the Angelus, and he would encourage his patients to do the same. Wow. Yeah, which was pretty cool. Yeah, but that is pretty cool. And he fasted from meat every Saturday as well. Now, he also lived a uh, chaste life. He gave up the chance to start a family. Um, at the age of 34, so he would have been in the physical and spiritual prime of his life, or a physical and um, intellectual prime, um, he made this vow. It was thought that he did this just to be able to dedicate himself more fully to his patients. Well, that, now that's dedication. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to share a little bit about his um, death and path to sainthood. So he died on April 12, 1927. So he had attended Mass that day, received Holy Communion, was doing his rounds in the hospital. In the afternoon, he was back at his um, home office and seeing patients as well. And so he had a consult with the patient. And when they had left, he suddenly felt ill and just ended up dying quite peacefully. And so he was only 46 years old at the oh time he died. Goodness. So he was yeah, quite, yeah. quite young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now at the time of his death, the Cardinal of Naples told St. Giuseppe's family, the professor did not belong to you, but to the church. When he went up, he was greeted not by those whose bodies he healed, but by those whose souls he saved. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just amazing to hear the uh, cardinal say that about mm -hmm. him, you know, shortly after his, his death. And even within, you know, a short while after his death, the sadness of him passing seemed to be changing to more of a sentiment of admiration of his sanctity. Two days after his death, his confessor asked his relatives to keep his belongings because they were oh, relics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a pretty strong he knew sense. Something of, was up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, now he was beatified on November sixteenth, nineteen seventy-five, uh, and Pope Paul VI says uh, he was a physician who made his profession the arena for an apostolate, a mission of charity, a means of lifting himself up and of winning over others to Christ the Savior. Mm -hmm. which is so true. I mean, that's such an amazing way to summarize his, his work. And he was canonized on October 25th, 1987. So the cool part about this is that there was a synod being held at the time on the vocation and mission of the lay faithful in the church and in the world. So Pope John Paul called uh, Giuseppe a concrete realization of the ideal of the Christian layman. Mm -hmm. And this was because of his constant relationship with God. So his feast day is on November 16th, which was the day he was okay. beatified. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most often times it would be on the day a person dies. Right. Uh, but because he died on April 12th, that would coincide oftentimes with Easter or oh, with okay. Holy Week. Yeah. So um, they decided the, uh, what was it, the Archbishop of Naples asked the congregation for divine worship to transfer the feast to mm -hmm. November 16th. Okay. I also wanted to share the miracles that are associated oh, with his um, yes. beatification and canonization. So the first one was the healing of Constantino Nazzaro. He was diagnosed with Addison's disease in 1945, so there's no cure at the time. And he began to pray to Giuseppe Moscati in the spring of 1954, and he was praying the rosary every day in front of this image of Giuseppe. Now one night between the end of August and September 1954, beginning of September 1954, he had, uh, Nazaro had this dream of being operated on by St. Giuseppe Muscati, who replaced the atrophied part of his body with healthy living tissues. Mm -hmm. And then in his dream, Giuseppe told him to stop taking his medication. And when he woke up, he found he was healed and he was able wow. to return to work, which was pretty cool. 
The second miracle is, uh, involves a 13-year-old boy by the name of Raphael Parada, who was cured of meningococcal meningitis. And this was between the night of February 7th and 8th, 1941. So Raphael was quite sick. And I mean, meningococcal meningitis can be a very serious and lethal condition. Sure. So his level of consciousness had decreased. He was delirious. He wasn't recognizing anyone. So the family called the physician. The physician put a needle into his spine to draw some of the fluid out. And there were signs of this meningococcal disease. Mm -hmm. Now one of the, I mean, given the serious nature of the diagnosis, his family just assumed he was going to die. In fact, they had already prepared a white garment for a burial. Mm -hmm. The local priest said, okay, why don't you pray to uh, Giuseppe? And sure enough, within a few hours, the boy came to normal consciousness mm -hmm. and recognized everyone. The next day, the spinal tap was repeated. There was no signs of any disease. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so Amazing. it was pretty dramatic. That is dramatic. And it sounds like he went back to normal because they said he was eating pasta soup, everything. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it's like a good 13-year-old Italian 13, boy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the third miracle is uh, the healing of Giuseppe Montefusco from acute myeloblastic leukemia. So he was diagnosed in 1978 and had been undergoing chemo for about a year. Now, his mom had this dream of uh, seeing this photograph of a physician in a white gown. And in her dream, many people were bringing an offering to get a, a picture of this physician. So in her dream, she joined them and she offered 2,000 lire for this, this picture. And so when she woke up in the morning, she told her pastor about the dream. And he said, oh, well, you must be thinking of Giuseppe Muscati. So she went to the church of Gesù Nuevo, which is where he um, was laid to rest and saw the picture that she had dreamed of. Oh. And any guesses to the cost? It was 2,000 lire for the, <laughs> exactly. for the picture. So yeah, no, no coincidence there. Uh, so wow. when she got the, the photo, the family and friends you know, prayed constantly in front of the photo. And over the course of a month, he was cured. Now, um, Giuseppe Montefusco was, was married on November 16th. So the oh. feast day for, for Giuseppe was cured. Sure. And they also named their uh, first daughter, Juzi, so the female version of Giuseppe. Great. So he's just got such a wonderful life. And like I was saying earlier, I mean, in terms of um, he was a lay person that just dedicated his entire life to God. And I think that that is just such a fantastic example of a lay person. It's so dedicated. I, you know, often people say, well, I'm not going to be a saint. You know, I'm not a priest. I'm not a nun. I'm not a, a religious person. But, you know, this is an example of a lay person that just really, I mean, the spiritual life and the physical life were one yeah, for him. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and God had first place in his life, you know, first and foremost. And, and you think, oh, a doctor who's busy, from the, you know, what you're ta telling us, and he went to Mass every day yeah. and prayed the rosary every day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what an example. Yeah, and with his, you know, time in prayer and fasting, I mean, he, everything was for God. Mm -hmm. And like you say, yeah, he's just such a wonderful example for, for us as lay people. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in terms of the, you know, the impact you can have on people in whatever you know, work role you have. Exactly. So, yeah, it was mm -hmm. uh, definitely a treat reading his book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, uh, if, when you're reading that book, you feel like it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And, yeah. You know, it's just such a wonderful example of, of, yeah, how can we can live as lay people and, and serve God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you're obviously drawn to him. You know, like, why are you personally, why do you, why are you drawn to him? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so within my line of work, so I work as a family physician. Mm -hmm. And so for me, Giuseppe is a wonderful example of how, you know, I can live out my work mm -hmm. and trying to serve God um, just as he did. And just in terms of the level of dedication and seeing someone as both, you know, body and soul, mm -hmm. um, seeing them, seeing the whole person. You know, I think too often times in medicine we uh, get caught up in just treating the, the physical or the biological right. stuff and not recognizing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Giuseppe, that was not uh, not a concern at all. So yeah, he's just mm -hmm. such a wonderful example. Mm -hmm. Good. I really appreciate this because I really didn't know very much about him and I think that we might have a few viewers who, you know, they, he'll be new to them. So I really appreciate that.
In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Saint Giuseppe Muscati, renowned doctor and scientist, as you practiced your profession, you treated the body and the soul of your patients. Protect us also who now confidently turn to you. Give us physical and spiritual health by interceding for us with our Lord. Relieve the pain of those who suffer. Give comfort to the sick, consolation to the afflicted, hope to the discouraged. May young people find in you a model, worksman and example, the elderly comfort, the dying hope for an eternal reward. Be for us all a sure guide in the practice of diligence, honesty, and charity, so that we might perform our duties in a Christian manner and give glory to God our Father. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.